after open telemetry. Yes, I got it. Um, and this is really an interesting space because for the longest time there was really no uh, standard for collecting and processing and ingesting um, any kind of telemetry signals, including logs, metrics, and traces. There were, and there still are, um, a lot of standards in the, the log space and uh, some in the, in the metric space, but for tracing, it, at least there was not really a standard. So we're going to have a look at what open telemetry is and how we can use it and talk about ADOT specifically also um, and best practices around that. So let's step in a little bit before we get into, into the details and trying to look at the problem we're trying to solve here on a, on a high level. We have a number of sources that might be, you know, an AWS API or the Kubernetes, or it might be the operating system, it might be your own code in a Lambda function, whatever compute you're using. In the same way, we have storage um, that, you know, acts as a source. You might have some files in a free bucket or something um, in MSK, in Managed Kafka, um, or in DynamoDB or in RDS or wherever. And all of those uh, sources, compute and storage, they emit signals. And there is still a, a number of, of different agents, some of them open source, some of them are proprietary, some of them are single um, signals, some of them can do more than one, um, but you have to deal with, with you know, a bunch of them. And then you want to ingest these telemetry signals into various destinations, back ends, uh, front ends, and so on. That's where the observability really takes place. That's where you glean these actual insights from the, the signals that the source is in it. Now, we're looking at this bit in the middle, the agent, right? That's, that's middleware. We're trying to consolidate that into one way to do things. So that's the standard way of collecting, processing, and ingesting telemetry signals. Uh, what is open telemetry? Well, it's uh, right after Kubernetes, the second most active project, the CNCF project, Cloud Native Computing Foundation, and we're quite active in that space. And everyone is behind that. Every ISV in that space, etc. Cloud provider. And really, what it is, it's a number of specifications, including the open telemetry protocol (OTLP), a bunch of semantic conventions. Um, there are two types um, of, of metadata available in open telemetry. The one are so-called resource attributes. Think about that. That's on the left-hand side where a certain signal comes from. For example, you could say this comes from this part and this namespace from this uh, Kubernetes cluster. Um, and then there are signal um, attributes that, that are specific to signals. Um, so you can, for example, say this is an HTTP request or relational database query or whatever. And those semantic conventions are agreeing upon how you name things that really drives correlation. So being able to jump from one um, signal type in the backend to the other. Then there is this uh, universal agent called collector. I'm gonna talk about that quite a, a bit. And then there are the SDKs, so covering 11 different programming language in, in total. And some of them provide auto instrumentation. So without code changes, you can generate currently uh, at least traces. So summarizing that coming from those sources, either infrastructure, so that's you know an API that you might be using that you don't own. So there you can just deal with whatever is there, whatever logs or traces or metrics are emitted. And then the apps, that's the, the code that you own and you can you know, do whatever you like. You can you know, uh, decide to go for auto instrumentation. You can um, decide to manually instrument, et cetera. And, um, this really, uh, in the middle, that's where open telemetry provides this unified way to pro process and, and correlate the telemetry and ingesting it into the backends. Where are we? Started out open telemetry as a merge of two distributed tracing projects in CNCF. That's why the tracing was the first signal type that you know, um, became stable. Uh, last year, we focused on metrics and upstream, and this year on logs. So logs are almost there. Um, but there are still some, some uh, things that, that need to be done. Um, in contrast to traces and metrics, OpenTelemetry has a very 
strong opinionated way to do things in terms of the API and the model. With logs, it's a little bit more um, adapting on to the reality what is out there. So there are these bridges in, in the SDKs that essentially allow you to continue to use whatever you're using, log for change, Java, for example, um, and then that would take care of um, making it compatible with OTLP. Um, ADOT really is our distribution focusing on, on this collector. And we're currently um, pretty much aligned with, with what Upstream has um, in GA metrics and traces um, supported, meaning we can um, receive support from our side. And uh, we're Upstream first. So we are always contributing Upstream to open telemetry and then pulling it into our monthly releases. Uh, we pr do provide native integrations for EKS, ECS, and Lambda. A little bit on that in, in a bit. The SDKs that in, in ADOT, what we have is essentially uh, Java, JavaScript, Python, and .NET, and two of them, Java and Python, um, actually also have um, auto instrumentation, and uh, we're working getting that expanded to other languages and also uh, expanding it to, to metrics. Uh, there, we don't do anything special. We essentially vent the upstream SDKs, uh, provide support, provide sample applications, testing, et cetera, but we don't vent our own SDKs in contrast to the collector. Talking about the collector, the collector really um, is this universal agent and uh, essentially works um, based on these pipelines. In a pipeline, the pipeline is dedicated to one specific uh, telemetry signal type. So you can have metrics or logs or traces pipelines. You can have more than one pipeline. You could have, for example, uh, metrics slash dev, metrics slash prod, um, dedicated to you know, dev and, and prod environments. Um, and then in the pipeline, you would assemble your pipeline in, in three different parts. And that's receivers. That's You define the way how the, the telemetry data is collected, for example, natively in OTLP, or if you want to replace your Prometheus uh, script environment with, with open telemetry, you would use the Prometheus receiver or file log for reading um, files, uh, logs from, from standard in, uh, from standard out in, in your environment. Um, have processors, some of them are uh, very basic, I would say, like the batch processor, some of them are very sophisticated uh, or even specific to certain signal types like the tail sampling processor for, for traces. Um, and these processes allow you to manipulate both the da data, the telemetry data and the metadata. So you know, attributes processor allow you to uh, do, uh, apply certain um, operations to the attributes. Um, and you can do transform, you can filter, you can apply certain policies, say like drop certain um, PII data, for example. And then the exporters, that's the last step in the pipeline, um, allow you to essentially say how to ingest the, the signals into the backends. And on the right hand side, you see essentially the um, components that we currently ship in the ADOT collector. Uh, each of those goes through a, a very um, you know, long and, and thorough um, vetting process from code level to pen testing, et cetera. So we want to make sure that because security is, is our you know, number one priority that um, all of those are uh, well known to essentially avoid things like log 4 j in this, in this context. And um, they're limited if you compare it with upstream contrib, um, but that's, that's a, a you know, uh, decision that we make that we say, these are the, the use cases that we can support from, from our service team perspective. And um, based on, on customer feedback, we prioritize adding new components in a selective way. Now you can, if you want to, um, directly ingest the um, telemetry data from the SDKs into some backend. But typically in most use cases, a collector is more flexible because with that, you can essentially change the destination um, through a configuration change in the collector. Otherwise, you have everything hard coded. You would need to change settings um, in your in your application. Whereas with the collector, you can essentially say like, okay, um, you know, currently I'm sending it to some local self managed and then uh, to some managed uh, provider um, backend, and all of that is really just a configuration change in the collector. And that works for uh, quite a few cases up to the point in time where um, the scaling is really a challenge. So what you can do there is uh, using the so-called gateway mode um, where you have essentially 
um, the collector usually horizontally scaled behind the load balancer. Um, and this allows you to essentially separate, you can, can come directly from the SDK or having a, a, a collector in between. Um, but the point essentially being is that this gate in the gateway mode, you have everything centrally managed in terms of um, access keys, I'm roles if you're using AWS back and um, can enforce policy uh, centrally there, things like, you know, filter this kind of information or do sampling or whatever. Um, and typically, whatever is on the right hand side, the load balancer and the, the horizontally sharded uh, collectors, that's owned by an infrastructure platform team. Um, and the, the application teams, as I said, they can directly use the SDK or a collector that they locally configure. Um, in, in agent mode, what we saw on the previous slide, and decide what kind of receivers they are using. And the OTLP in between essentially standardizes everything in one. Um, so you don't need to worry about different um, you know, mechanisms, whatever. And, and um, there's one uh, kind of advancement to that. If you are doing certain operations uh, like um, tail sampling, for example, um, you would need to not just use the load balancer for the additional layer um, with the load balancer. Uh, exporter and, and that would make sure that all the spans of a trace land at, uh, in, in a certain um, collector on the, on the right hand side. Um, you can read up on, on all of that in the docs and the deployment you see the, the details for all of that and in that context there is also an interesting um, a note or a docs entry on the scaling that summarizes the scaling best practices um, from you know, in different environments, what to do and what not to do. Um, that's what we are typically contributing. So that's uh, the, the docs in upstream, for example, that one I, I wrote myself, um, got feedback from the community and it's a really great place to uh, get started. Uh, if you are interested in, I can only recommend that everything from blog posts to, as I said, the docs, there is uh, more than enough work to do. So let's now have a look at a concrete um, example of an, of an ADOT collector in, um, in, in use. So in this case, what we're looking at here is um, using the ADOT collector as a drop-in replacement for Prometheus. So if you have metrics in Prometheus exposition format from your application or from within communities, um, you can set up the collector in a way that you're using a Prometheus receiver and everything that you see here under the under uh, Prometheus receivers, Prometheus essentially your Prometheus script configs. So you can take that and paste it in directly there. And you would have processor in this case, which is the batch processor with a set timeout. And then the exporter in this case, the Prometheus remote write, which um, performs the ingest into, into managed Prometheus. Um, and below there, you see the actual definition of the pipelines, so the metrics pipeline, where you assemble the various components, receivers, et cetera, et cetera. And that is really all that you need. And you can essentially change that on the fly. If you, for example, um, decide, you know, you're moving, you're starting out with Prometheus and then you're moving over to OTLP, you would only need to change that receiver to OTLP. Um, create the, the new um, restart the, the, the collector, which by and large is stateless, and that would pick up the new uh, configuration and, and start receiving that in OTLP rather than in, uh, scraping it in, with Prometheus. So very powerful, but it also comes with certain challenges, uh, especially from the operational point of view. Luckily, um, the uh, collector exposes a wealth of uh, self telemetry. Um, I just highlighted three uh, of the most used um, examples here. The logs, they tell you exactly, specifically in the beginning, um, what you always want to see is this everything is ready, beginning, beginning running and processing. Uh, the most often things that, uh, so in this case, we're looking at that at the deployment in a, in a collector uh, and in Kubernetes, but uh, you know, could be any environment you could run that locally or whatever. Um, it essentially says, okay, uh, I'm parsing the, the collector configuration. I know all of those uh, components that are in there and uh, you know, have, have assembled the, the pipeline and I'm ready to go. Um, the most challenging things that I've seen are when um, you're using components that are 
not supported by your distribution. So if you're using a vendor and you're using a component, there are over 180 components up there in Contrib um, and you're using it, but it's not supported, it's not part of your of your container image, for example, um, then you know, essentially we'll say, well, I don't know that and it will fail and you know, crash, not crash, but it will essentially say, I, I can't start. Um, same is true for if you're, it's the second gotcha there, if you are, um, going back to, to the previous one, if you are um, just define a component here, but you don't use it in a pipeline, it, it's as if it's not there, right? So you always have to use um, all of the components that you that you want to uh, in the pipeline. Otherwise, it's it's you know on, only essentially what is below the service key that is that is what is actually used. The rest is is just there in terms of configuration. But if it, if you don't use it in the pipeline, any of the pipelines, then it's as if it's not there. Moving on to to the metrics part, uh, it's an example of a dashboard where you see not only the overall health and, and uh, you know, memory and CPU usage, but also what is going on in the pipelines, how uh, busy are the pipelines, um, how busy are the processors in there and the exporters, uh, you see change. Um, and that you can essentially use to say, okay, on the one hand, you might be uh, doing some scaling based on that. For example, in the simplest case, um, you could do CPU or memory, but usually you would want to do a little bit more sophisticated. So essentially looking at how the pipelines are doing and saying, okay, I need that kind of headroom. Um, and that's also this, this thing that you can, can use to alert on uh, typically better than, than the low level stuff like CPU and memory. Um, last but not least on the right lower side here, this is an example uh, using the profile. So um, the collector exposes uh, profiles uh, in pprof format. The profile is essentially gives you an insight on um, the memory, CPU, and, and runtime usage um, attached with uh, a certain code path or code fragment. So there you can essentially say, see where exactly um, the collector is spending time and spending memory and, and CPU. And we usually also use that to, to debug if you really need to know um, in troubleshoot details where something is going wrong um, because the configuration might be right, but um, overall, but there might be tweaks necessary in terms of you know, settings, buffer sizes or whatever uh, that you don't really see, right? It's semantically and, and, and syntactically correct, but it's it, it doesn't perform as you, as you imagine. And you don't always get that from, from the metrics. They give you this aggregated global view, but the profiles um, do actually give you that insight um, and that's a, it's a really great way. And that's most of the, those things are also mentioned uh, in, in greater detail on the docs. They're not the main docs, but in this um, the collector um, and a troubleshooting uh, and giving you a rundown on, on all of that. Challenge there is sometimes that things are um, slightly still changing for metrics, for example, moving from the Prometheus metrics to native OTLP. So you would still need to keep an eye on that. Um, but by and large, um, you know, if you have something in place, that's, that's certainly useful. Moving on to uh, the usage in terms of how you might want to use a dot, at least in the context of AWS, you can go ahead and use the standalone. As I said, we, we do monthly releases, um, and you, know, you could use the executable or um, container image directly, or you can use the higher level integrations like the KS add on, um, ECS, uh, Sidecar, or Lambda layers. And essentially, what it looks like is um, you can do that through the, the console, essentially enable that, that add-on. What we are doing there is essentially taking the upstream open telemetry operator, put that behind an EKS API uh, and allow you to, um, you know, in this case, it's the, uh, writing uh, metrics to, to manage Prometheus, where you just need to provide this one endpoint. Um, and the same you can obviously do on the CLI. Um, it's, it's literally, just the, the open telemetry operator upstream um, default with, with our um, collector image. Um, and then you can just go ahead and, and use it. And that's the, the advantage there is that you can use that in any environment, right? It's just that if you're using an in, in EKS, then you're benefiting from, from the EKS API. And this is a very flexible setup. So in, in, in 
in context of Kubernetes, I can absolutely recommend uh, using the, the open calamity operator there. In ECS, it's essentially a sidecar. So there are um, a couple of, of YAML files that you can use uh, out of the box. And this one shows you the, the default ECS uh, task level metrics that you get. And again, it's, it's very simple. You essentially just provide an endpoint of AMP or say, send it to CloudWatch metrics or uh, traces to X-ray um, and off you go. It's, it's uh, very, very straightforward. You can also script uh, Prometheus metrics that requires a little bit more configuration, um, but yeah, out of the box, typically you want that. And last but not least, uh, Lambda layers. Um, there, uh, you need to essentially first uh, enable active tracing in, in Lambda. Um, you need to set certain environment variables, and then you can optionally also provide that uh, collector config. We have a stripped down version of the collector in the Lambda layers. So it's the language SDKs, Java, JavaScript, Python, and whatnot, and um, the, the collector, uh, fewer components than, than the, the the normal one, what you get in EKS or ECS, uh, has mostly to do with footprint. If you're running into issues around cold start, um, you probably want to check the uh, auto instrumentation configuration for Java and Python. Um, the the anti-pattern there is essentially the, the best practice, if you wish, is only to enable the auto instrumentation for the frameworks that you're using. Otherwise, it can take quite a, a while. The auto instrumentation will essentially try to apply everything and you know. Cold cold start issues are the, the um, outcome of, out of that. Um, yeah, and last but not least, um, I want to encourage you to start uh, using Open Parameter in general and, and ADOT specifically. We have a number of resources there, um, workshop walks you through an end-to-end -end example. Um, there are best practices um, that are more specific recipes and FAQs. We have an accelerator that if you are uh, using Terraform, you can essentially with one command, um, ramp up everything from manage Grafana, manage Prometheus, and at the dot uh, EKS add-on, and you have an entire end-to-end -end setup for certain scenarios. And then there are the developer docs that um, in, in detail describe what, what I went through now. Okay, um, that's all I had prepared. So I'm now open to questions. Uh, I think Aniket, you had a question. Um, go ahead. You can ask. Hi, hey. uh, hi, Michael. Yeah. Uh, so uh, the open uh, the hotel SDK is that support auto in instrumentation, right? So as part of best practices, do they emit only metrics or traces or like both or is that configurable? Currently, the auto instrumentation is limited to a handful. Uh, and it is limited to uh, traces, okay. Um, which in most cases is really where the biggest uh, demand really is. If you think about it, like everyone is already using logs, many systems, many libraries, uh, many folks are using metrics, uh, but we are working on, on that as well to extend the, both the coverage in terms of programming languages and um, extending it from traces to metrics, yes, absolutely. Right. Yeah. So last time uh, uh, in one of our sessions, uh, there was a question around uh, what is kind of the sizing that you need for hotel collector uh, to run it effectively. You touched upon it briefly, uh, but like what kind of problems people face uh, while running hotel collectors in your experience? Right. So the problem is that you can't really generally see anything about it. The, the the way how we approach that is, let me share that link with you. It's by the way, a great, great uh, question, not not prepared. Um, so let me see you on Zoom. Oh yeah, can you see that? Um, that essentially gives you a breakdown on what across various TPS, um, what various components like receiver, processor, exporter um, use the average CPU and memory, max CPU and max memory. Interesting. So this is really um, what you can take as a, as, a, as a baseline and see like, okay, um, you know, this is what, what you might want to size. And then the main question really is, um, 
what kind of scaling strategy do you have? Is it entirely vertical? I see that uh, especially in, in smaller environments, in more manual environments, where you essentially you know, run the collector on bigger machines, right? Um, in the context of Kubernetes, you do have the VPA, and depending on, on your environment, the vertical pod autoscaler uh, might be something, and specifically for, for um, stateless uh, workloads, that's that's perfectly fine. Um, but you know that's that's a little bit of of a, of a challenge. So the easiest way to go about it, really, from a, a scaling perspective, is really horizontal scaling. So essentially, meaning um, you know what we had here earlier on, you have multiple independent, for example, in communities that would be a deployment, and each of those collector would run in a pod. Um, it does require you that they have a load balancer, and as I said, for certain uh, types of operations, you need to uh, use specific. Um, Open telemetry components like load balancing exporter to make sure that the, the semantics are, are uh, like, for example, in, uh, tracing that the, all the spans land in the same collector so that they can uh, make meaningful decisions. Um, but at the end of the day, this horizontal scaling is for most use cases um, the, the best way to go about it and the easiest way to, to reason about it and um, to, to you know have almost infinite scalability there. Um, it is challenging, I'm, I'm not going to lie, but as I said, the, um, given that the collector itself provides so much um, insights and, and you know, all the telemetry it exposes, um, you shouldn't have a big problem to get everything that you need um, to, to make the decisions or, or troubleshoot it for this way. Right, and uh, you mentioned about uh, some of the metrics logs uh, or telemetry basically that the collector uh, was exposing. Uh, right. uh, in your recommendation, uh, what is sort of the good practice to monitor the collector itself? Because if the collector itself is degraded, then probably the pipeline that is getting collector metrics is also affected by that. So um, any recommendations around right. monitoring that? Right. Yeah, as I said, uh, where do we have the, uh, where did I have that? Um, there are two things that you can and probably you, you should keep an eye on both, right? The one are the low level um, things when low level signals are essentially mean CPU and memory, right, uh, by and large. And that's great, right? But that alone doesn't really tell you a lot. So you, you don't want to, to, you know, run into a situation where your pod, your collector pod gets wound. That's, that's obviously the case. But the more sensible way to look at it is really looking at the um, metrics around the components, around you know, how the pipelines are doing, how busy are processors, et cetera. So that's usually um, in the long term, you want to apply machine learning and you know, establish baselines automatically, et cetera, the, the better way to go about it. Can be tricky because it requires you to take your specific uh, setup. And, and, and again, think of that this, the collector is really just, it's, it's essentially just Lego bricks, right? You can, together any sorts of valid combination of, of, of components in the pipeline. So it's really hard to tell what's going on in a specific case, right? Because it depends on what receivers, processor, exporters in, in combination you're using. Uh, are you using, for example, different pipeline types in the same collector? Or are you, um, what I also quite often see, having dedicated um, collector configurations per signal type so that you have one collector or one set of collectors behind the load balancer dedicated to metrics and one dedicated to traces, etc. So at the end of the day, you really, there is currently no general way to say how a collector is performing because it very much depends on the configuration of, of the pipeline, right? Like in, in general case, I don't know what kind of receivers are you using there. You might be using one or multiple, right? You might be using OTLP for traces and Prometheus a receiver for metrics. Um, the processors can make a huge difference, right? If you're using a number of those processors and technically each of those pipelines is a go routine in the collector, right? Um, so, and again, if you're familiar with Go and, and you know, 
coroutines and that's how, how these things work, uh, the, the concurrency aspect there. Uh, there are many things that you can tweak, but at the end of the day, you need to understand what is going on in that pipeline. And I would keep it as simple as possible because if you have too many things going on, it's hard to reason about it. It's hard to, to predict what's going on. But at the end of the day, you need to um, essentially for each variation of your configuration uh, do the tests make sure that you understand what's going on um, and, and and derive the, the performance metrics from that there's unfortunately no general way because it is this kind of flexible that's, that's the upside the downside is that there is not one single way to optimize it or to understand it you literally have to do that work Got it. And in such cases, like, do people then like multiple collectors, uh, instead of just scaling one, uh, because you mentioned about processor overhead and so on. So, is that what you observe, like, just running multiple uh collectors for different purposes, uh, so that yes. you don't run into yes. yes, because different signal types have different different characteristics, right? Mm -hmm. Um, logs might be, you know, the payload might be quite big, right? Especially if you're dealing with some, some legacy system that you know, has maybe potentially unstructured, maybe in the best case, JSON, uh, but probably not really a schema. Um, traces, on the other hand, you have a really high dynamic, right? You have um, synchronous, you have asynchronous operations, et cetera. Um, metrics have, it's like this, uh, having dedicated collector or collectors uh, for, for different signal types, definitely seems to be one of the of the most basic uh, best practices around um, that usually you start out in a dev test environment where you're essentially trying out you know to understand how these pipelines work and then when once you move towards production where you're thinking about the operational uh, aspects what to alert on how to scale uh, etc then uh, you typically move that out and, and it's fairly straightforward right you can just take the the configuration then factor out or remove parts that are not not applicable yeah. all right any other questions oh uh, yeah uh, i have uh, one more and yeah. i'm just trying to summarize a situation that I had run into uh, about a couple of days back with uh, someone that i was talking to and this was related very specifically to aws distro and aws uh, x-ray yeah. So, given that um, we were trying to uh, do traces uh, starting from the service that was fronting our front-end application, which was an AWS Lambda function, and trying to trace all the way down till the back-end. And this also involved AWS API Gateway, which was kind of fronting the Lambda function. Uh, while we did try to use AWS Distro, this caused huge latencies on the Lambda function, whereas it was serving requests in under less than a few milliseconds, uh, let's say 20 milliseconds and suddenly shot up to 100 uh, MS. Anything that, uh, uh, I mean, any approach wise, uh, any best practices or something that I am missing out when I was trying to implement. I don't, I don't have a question here, but yeah, this is something that I ran into and I'm trying to like capture it in a thoughtful way. Right. right. Um, so for, a dot the, the way how we do Lambda is essentially we package both the SDKs and auto instrumentation and the collector in there. So um, as I said, for languages where there is auto instrumentation, you can still tweak something, uh, you know, could disable auto instrumentation and all see if that makes a difference, then enable only the ones that are. If there is no um, um, auto instrumentation support for, for the language, then there is not much you can do. Then, you know, it's a, it's a matter of, it's certainly something we're considering to provide a, um, a Lambda layer that uh, only has the SDK and not the, the collector. So there is, a, a, unfortunately, a price to pay there uh, given the, yeah. the complexity. So there is, um, but the, the cold start issues that I'm talking about here really is um, something from, you know, let's say usually 800 milliseconds to 4,000 milliseconds, right? Those are really auto-instrumentation driven where the auto-instrumentation tries to apply all the, you know, in Java there are over 100 uh, frameworks and libraries that, that you know, are auto-instrumented. So it, it takes quite a while. So in, in these smaller regions, uh, there is usually not much you can do. And even if you try to, um, but 
you could do what we're considering essentially doing it without the collector, right? So in the lambda layer, only having the SDK in there and only doing manual instrumentation. Um, but still, there is there is a, a cost to pay. So it's it's uh, cold set issues. If you have something low latency, then yeah, you 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 will pay that price. All right. I think I did the picture. Okay. Cool. Uh, question was also in chat. Uh, yes, the slides will be uh, available. I'll share them, and, and uh, I know there would be so, some way that they would be distributed, but I'll share them. Yes, absolutely. All right. Yeah, I think um, any other questions? Otherwise, we can wrap up. Yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot for all the questions. Great questions.